Hi, everyone. <laughs> this is weird because I don't know if anyone's actually out there listening, but hopefully you are. <laughs> We're dealing with some slight technical issues, so I just want to make sure everything's okay. All right, great. Katie, can you actually just click over to comments up there? Perfect. So um, I'm just going to start talking, and uh, if anybody has questions or wants to jump in, shoot us a comment, and we'll be able to see it, hopefully. This is all new to me, too, and I can address it. But what I'm going to do is just cover some basics about what the class is for, what we're going to cover, what you can expect, and then we'll talk a little bit about assignments, <laughs> everyone's favorite topic. And then um, if you want to ask some questions, we can have time for that. And then at the end, if we have time left over, I'd love to address some of your excellent pre-class assignments and just give some of my thoughts on all the great input that we got. All right. <laughs> I really feel like I'm speaking to an empty room here, um, but I'll try to just visualize all your faces. So what's the purpose of this class? We are here to learn how to create a brand strategy. What does that mean? Well, the word brand, of course, gets thrown around a lot. I run into a lot of very clever people who ask me if my work involves cattle. Um, but in the interest of not overcomplicating things, I would say that to boil it down, a brand is simply an idea. If you have a product, um, the brand is the idea that it stands for. It's, it's essence. It's, it's soul. It's the intangible thing that makes you love a product, that makes you identify with it. Thank you, Colin, for telling me that you're here. <laughs> I feel so much better. <laughs> Colin O'Rourke is my new favorite student. <laughs> um, so, you know, thinking about the example of the chewing gum, which, and Whitney, <laughs> and Gabe, this is great. All right, guys, I really appreciate that. So we have the example of the chewing gum, um, which is one of the sample businesses that you can choose to brand in this class. Of course, you should feel free to brand whatever you want, including yourself. But imagine that we're all launching a new brand of chewing gum. Um, so obviously, the brand needs to be—I mean, the gum needs to be delicious. You know, if it's disgusting gum, it doesn't matter how awesome the brand is. You know, people might buy it, but they're not going to keep buying it if it's gross. But the reason people are going to choose this gum is about so much more than how it tastes. Um, you know, when they go into a store, even more importantly, when they're carrying it around and handing it out to their friends, when this is the brand that they choose to display, it's because they've bought into an idea. And, you know, you see this all the time. I mean, look at bottled water. Um, look at vitamin water. Sure, they fooled everyone by calling it vitamin water, but also, the reason people loved it, it was fine tasting, but it was cool. It had fun copy. It had great design. Um, and this is something you experience every day in the choices that you make and in the products and the places that make up your world, the places and the products that you choose to identify with. So we're here to learn how to create an idea that will lead to a brand that matters to people, that matters to you. Of course, it doesn't stop there, right? Um, you know, my job is definitely at the beginning of the process. And once you have the idea, you still need to design the actual brand experience, which is no easy feat. But if you don't start with a clear idea, you can have the coolest design in the world, but it's not going to connect with people because it doesn't mean something to them. So that's what we're going to learn how to do. 
<laughs> and the first place that we're going to start is um, with background and research and learning a little bit about how to conduct research that will lead to a strong brand. So before you decide what your brand is going to stand for, you need to do a little digging. And um, whenever I sit down to write a brand strategy, the very first thing I do is I try to get into the mind of the consumer. You know, I try to think about who is this brand for? Because brands don't exist in the ether, right? The, the purpose of them is to connect with people. So we have to ask ourselves three quick key questions. Who is it for? What do they need? And how is our brand uniquely suited to meet that need. And if you sit down and you go through the exercise of asking yourself these three questions, you can figure out where you have information gaps. You know, sometimes your questions are going to center around the who is it for part, right? The consumer, or even what do they need. You might have behavioral questions, going back to the chewing gum um, idea, you know, that idea starts off by introducing the fact that the gum category is in decline. Well, why is the gum category in decline? Why aren't people chewing as much gum as they used to? What are they doing instead? You know, what flavors are appealing to them? These types of sort of broad behavioral questions are well suited for quantitative research. So that's reaching a bunch of people and being able to draw conclusions. Um, you know, if you spoke to two people about why they aren't chewing gum, it's harder to draw widespread conclusions than if you speak to a hundred. Um, but often we don't have these types of behavioral questions and instead what we have are deeper, more psychological questions. And this would be in the territory of, you know, what role does gum play in people's lives? What does gum mean to them? What do they seek in a gum? What associations do they have with gum? Um, what could get them to chew more gum? These types of questions are much more well suited for qualitative research, which would be like a focus group. And that's where you, know, you get people in a room in front of you, it's a small group, but you can really dig deep and get rich insights that will inspire ideas. And that's, you know, an insight is really what we're seeking here, right? That's, the, that's what we call the core truth about the consumer that we're trying to tap into, that sort of deep need that the brand can answer. That's the consumer insight. But we also have cases where the consumer insight is much more obvious. Um, I don't know if you guys had a chance to read the two business ideas, but the other business idea was this technology that I kind of thought of in a dream, and I'm sure it'll happen any day now, and I hope so. But it's basically the opportunity to have um, your passport and your license on your phone. So that's very, very clear how that fits into people's lives, right? Um, you know, obviously there's a benefit to having your passport on your phone. You don't have to remember it. You're not going to panic when you get to the airport. That doesn't make our job easier, though. Um, in a way, it makes it even more challenging because you still have to find a way to make your brand interesting. And convenience is a pretty boring benefit. And it's also one that's really hard to own. You know, let's say this technology does come out and there's a way to have your passport on a phone. There's no way that someone else isn't going to launch that and something better, you know, any day. So the way that you have to distinguish, distinguish yourself is, is through a brand because technology like that, it's very hard for it to remain proprietary. So in this case, you might look around and ask yourself, you know, how are other technology brands in related spaces positioning themselves? What type of language are they using? What's the tonality? Is there a way to carve out a unique emotional territory for this fairly functional product? And these types of questions are well suited for a competitive review. And that's where you start to collect imagery and language from other brands. You can make even you know, a collage of this, um, bring it all together and really look for common themes. And then find areas of opportunity, find ways to stand out. So brands, you know, in the real world, not in our Skillshare world, um, can spend, you know, weeks, even months on research. It can cost hundreds of thousands of dollars. But um, because, you know, we're trying to do this fast and scrappy, I'm going to give you just some quick ideas of how you can conduct research over the next week. Um, 
So one would be setting up an online survey. There are providers like SurveyMonkey.com, SurveyMonkey, like the animal, and um, shouldn't be any longer than 15 questions. You're going to lose people's interest. And the other key thing is make it multiple choice. It is so much easier to write open-ended questions, and then it's so much harder to analyze the results. You do not want to be sifting through you know, hundreds of handwritten results. You just want to have data if you're going with this approach. And I'd say if you're going to do a survey, you know, take your own survey or have someone else take it and just make sure it's logical, make sure it's written in a way that actually makes sense for people, um, that you know, the questions are structured in a way that actually mimics how people think about these things. And then you know, post it on Facebook or email it to a bunch of people. Um, obviously, if we were doing this for a client, we'd want to be much more professional about how we're targeting people, we want to make sure we were reaching the right demographics, but for our purposes, just getting the hang of this, that's fine. Another fun one, if you are bold and like to embarrass yourself, is man on the street interviews. Um, and that's where you literally go up to people on a street, in a park, in a public place, and ask them like one quick question. So this would be if you have, you know, a very specific question and you just want a widespread response, you know, it's not very scientific, but it's a good way to just get gut reactions to something. Then there's my favorite methodology, which is focus groups, and that's where you bring people in a room, you know, six to eight people is probably the right number. You can bribe them with wine <laughs> or food, and, um, you know, hopefully they somewhat match your target audience in terms of demographics and also attitudes, behaviors, you know, back to the gum example, if you're doing that one, you don't want to bring a bunch of gum haters <laughs> into the room, you'd probably want to speak to people who like gum <laughs> at a basic level. Um, something else that you can do is one-on-one -on -one interviews, where you schedule just short interviews with specific people, these can happen in person, on the phone, online. And then lastly, the easiest approach is secondary research. And that's where you're going online, you're digging up articles, you're visiting stores. Um, and that can be extremely helpful as well. Um, so those are just some of the methodologies that we use that can help inform the branding process. But the most important thing that I would like to emphasize right now, so if you're multitasking and have not been listening, <laughs> listen to me now. Um, research should never be used as a crutch. You know, at the end of the day, your gut is so by far what matters the most in this process. And if you get too bogged down with testing everything and double checking everything, you're going to end up with a very safe, very expected brand. You know, people have a hard time telling you what they want because they don't know what they want. I think there's that famous Henry Ford quote, you know, if I asked people what they wanted, they would have said a faster horse. And that's totally true. <laughs> so, you know, I love research, but the reason why I love it is not because it offers proof, not because it's going to show you the way, but instead because it offers inspiration. Sometimes there's something one person can say out of 40 people you've spoken to that just sparks something new. It gets you out of your head. You know, you're not just stuck in your own world. You're out there in the world. You're talking to people, and it can bring you new ideas that you never would have thought of on your own. And not that you're going to hear those ideas word for word, but one thing one person says reframes the problem and sets you on a completely different path. So spend some time thinking about your branding assignment and what research plan might make the most sense for you. And um, that's my lecture. <laughs> and in the second half of our time, I just want to go over um, some quick bookkeeping stuff, and then I'd love to hear any questions people have. And if there are no questions, um, or if we still have time, we can talk through some of the pre-class assignment stuff. So just quickly, I want to go over schedule, especially because it's changed a few times as I've worked through the syllabus and thought about what makes the most sense. So today is Monday. Your first assignment is research. And um, your research findings are due on the 21st, which is next Sunday. And in terms of what format those need to take, it's really up to you. You know, you could write a one-page document about key things that you've learned. You could include charts if you did a survey. Things like SurveyMonkey make it very easy 
to create charts. I'd say that whatever you learn from your research, think about the way that makes the most sense to convey that. If you simply did secondary research, it might just be that you put together a presentation of quotes and images that you found. Um, so that's the first assignment. And then our next office hours is going to be on Wednesday, October 24th. So if you're done with your research and you want to get ahead, you can start working on the worksheet that's called Laying the Groundwork. And that one, it's in the syllabus now. That's going to be due Friday the 26th. And it's sort of the first step in writing your brief. It's just getting you thinking about your brand in the right way before you go to create the actual brief. So we'll talk more about how to do that in the next session. But if you're bored and you want to get ahead, feel free to get going on that too. And then you'll have a lot of time between the office hours on the 24th and the final office hours, which are Monday, November 5th, to work on your brief. And um, you're going to have a written portion, which is due October 30th, day before Halloween. And then the visual portion will be due that Friday on the 2nd. And that will give me time to look through it and give you, you know, great feedback on the fit. So any questions? You all still with us? <laughs> OK, we've got some great questions. Um, so Pop does has asked us, what about emailing previous customers as a part of research? Great idea, um, especially if you're thinking about a rebranding and you want to understand, you know, what's been working and, and what hasn't. You know, I think that um, that's a great idea. I would put together a quick survey, and I think especially if you're going to reach out to your customers, it's nice to give them some kind of incentive because you are asking them for a favor. So depending on how feasible that is. You know, can you offer them something free, or you know, a, a sweepstake? One person will be a, you know, will get a ten dollar gift certificate. I mean, it's not necessary, but you can do that just to get more participation. And then I have a quick survey, and I think the goal of that survey should be to find out what's core to your brand that you wouldn't want to change, but where is there room for improvements? So, Pop does let me know if that answers your question, or if you need any more information. And then Betsy Stella, how is research conducted for self-branding? Excellent question. For that, I'd reach out to your closest friends and colleagues. I think that if you're trying to brand yourself, the real challenge there is going to be figuring out your own unique benefit, right? That's a hard thing to know about yourself. Um, and I think you're definitely going to want some outside input on that. And I'd start by asking the people who know you best and who appreciate you the most what they think your strengths are, what they think your skills are, what makes you, you know, uniquely qualified versus anybody else, what makes you special. Um, I wouldn't post that on Facebook. I think that's a hard thing for a bunch of people to react to. I would really do one-on-one -on -one interviews and reach out to people who really know you and whose opinions that you trust. All right, Colin, what role does a mascot play in the branding strategy? Great question. So Colin brings up a very important point, which is the difference between brand strategy and brand identity. So right now, we're in the first stage, which is brand strategy. And that's figuring out what our brand is going to stand for, not how we're then going to depict the brand through visual design. So let's say we have a brand, I'm going to use a really stupid example, and it stands for courage. We then, in the next phase, might be working with our designers and think, oh, you know, let's have a lion as our logo. Um, but it's really in the next phase where you make the decision about whether you need an actual mark as part of the logo or whether it can be just typographic, like Google and the other examples that you list. And um, why don't we press pause on that, and as we get into creating our briefs and talking about sort of how strategy then needs to design, which is not something that will be fully covered in this class, but I can at least give you the tools to work with a designer, or if you are a designer yourself, to guide your design strategically. So let's save that question, but for now, you just need to be worrying about the essence of a brand and not then how that essence will get depicted to the world if that makes sense. 
All right, Gabe. Gabriel. Sorry, I nicknamed you. I don't even know you. Um, is there any advice for thinking about branding, doing brand research before you've really figured out your product, i.e. if your product is in some very early beta? I think so. Um, if, if it's really early, like you still don't even know what your product is, that might be soon to be thinking about creating a brand. However, there's certainly a place for research if you're still figuring out what your product is because that's a great way to figure out what it should be. You know, get people using it or talk to people and figure out if there's even a need for what you're thinking about creating. But I think by the time you want to sit down and write a brand strategy, you should have a pretty clear notion of what your product is. Otherwise, your job is going to be difficult. And that's not to say that you need to know every single feature. That's not to say that you can't keep iterating. This is a question we get asked a lot by our startup clients because, as many of you know, when you're launching a startup, things change every day. You know, you, you're beta testing, and you're meeting with investors, and you're shifting what you are. But that doesn't mean that you can't have a core identity that you're working towards. And I think it actually really helps you to have that identity. Um, I wrote an article called Brand Early Not Often, which is definitely in the resources. I don't know what week it's in, but it addresses this exact question, and I would say read it. <laughs> um, Rozzy, I, I hope I'm pronouncing your name right. Did you say that secondary research is easiest? Can you give me more examples of this? It seems harder to do if you're working on an innovative service or product. So I think the reason why I said it was easiest is because you can do it from your chair. Um, you know, you don't have to get out there and talk to people. You don't need to find an audience. Um, it's great for things like competitive research, finding out if something similar has been done. But you're absolutely right that in your case, if you're creating something that's never been created before, secondary research isn't going to be that useful to you. So it might be easiest, but it might not be the most beneficial methodology. And depending on what your specific questions are, it might not be feasible to answer them through secondary research. Um, I would recommend everybody do a bit of secondary research. I think that you know, no matter what you're looking into, with the exception of maybe self-branding, you want to find out what's going on in the category, what are the similar you know, products out there. If, there, if there is nothing similar, are there any articles that have been written about the issue you're trying to address, you know, it's just at a basic level, there's no reason not to do it. Do you have suggestions for resources on putting together strong surveys? That, uh, these questions are coming, okay, that's Jara. Oh no, that's sorry, that's Meredith. Um, Suggestions for resources. I, nothing is coming to mind, but that's a great question. And I can give you some tips right now, which are just keep it simple, make it multiple choice, don't lead people. So if you're going to make it multiple choice, you know, you don't want to have these like incredibly specific responses that wouldn't be how people would actually answer a question. I sometimes like to sort of ask the question in my head and think about what realistic replies would be from a random person and then have those be my choices. Um, but I will try to find an article on that for you over the next few days and I'll post it. I can't, I looked for one leading up to this and I, I couldn't find a great one. But also Meredith, if you have specific questions as you're putting together your survey or if you even want to send it to me. I'd be happy to look at it and give you more specific feedback. I'm sorry that I can't point you in the direction of something really helpful. I looked and I couldn't find anything. Um, if I am going through a rebrand brand process, should I post potential rebrand names in my survey? That's Jarrah. Um, so at this stage, I would not be doing a survey to sort of test names. Um, first of all, I think a survey is a very difficult, tricky way to test names. We've had some clients who have required us to test names through a survey, and what we've found is that consumers always pick 
the most obvious, um, the most expected, the most literal names. So I think that what you're going to want to do at this stage is get a better sense of insights, you know, figuring out what is it that people need, what are they interested in, what appeals to them, you know, what can your brand stand for that will matter to people, and then we'll work on a strategy, and then at that point, I would evaluate names. So once you have a clear sense of the idea that your brand should stand for, which is what this class will lead you to, then you can look at names, and you can see which name best lives up to that idea. And um, at that point, you know, if you feel the need to do some research, you can do some gut check research just to make sure there isn't some like horrible association with one of the names that you haven't thought of. But I wouldn't choose your name based on the results of a survey. I think that's a big mistake. Google would never be called Google. It would be called Easy Search if they had tested it. Um, okay, I think that we might be out of questions, which is good because we're also running out of time. Um, so in the last five minutes, I just want to point out some things that I thought were great. I mean, all of you who did the three class assignment did an awesome job. Um, but just to call your attention to a couple specific ones, Jane Bruner um, gave an amazing personality description of the brand Levenger, and it just I think it's worth reading for all of you because it really brings the brand to life. I read it and I'm not even really that familiar with Lavender and I got it. I was like, I get who that brand is and I, I want to get to know it. Um, I think that Shanice um, did a really good job getting into detail about the target consumer. She was writing about Obey clothing and talking about, you know, what the consumer cares about and you know who the ideal consumer is made up of and how the brand is going to relate to that. Whitney did something that I thought was really interesting and helpful. Whitney Bryan, she was talking about Whole Foods and she didn't just talk about what the brand is, she talked about what it's not. And sometimes that can actually be just as helpful as thinking about what it is. Um, but like I said, you've all done a great job. And um, if there aren't any other questions, oh, can we review the timeline again or post on the Skillshare site? Yes, so the timeline is posted on the site. It's gone live today. If you go through the syllabus, um, you'll see all of the milestones and all of the office hours. Um, so that's there, but I'm happy to quickly review it again. Let me just find it in my notes. All right. Our next office hours is going to be Wednesday the 24th, and our final office hours is Monday the 5th of November. And in between, you have a few assignment deadlines. Um, you have October 21st for your research findings. You have Friday the 26th for your laying the ground week worksheets. October 30th for the written portion of your brief, and then the visual portion is due on the 2nd. Now, obviously, there's no like punitive measures if you're late on these deadlines. It's just that if you want me to have a chance to look at what you've done, those are the dates that I'm posting for me to have time to review everything. Anything else? All right, well, I'm so excited to be teaching all of you, and I, I think this is going to be really fun. So thank you so much for those of you um, who made it tonight, and if you're watching this, after the fact, thank you for taking the time to do so. And um, you know, if you have any specific questions throughout, please feel free to use the Skillshare discussion tab. Um, you can reach out to me. You can also reach out to each other. You can form groups. I think the whole purpose of these hybrid classes is really for all of you to be able to come together and use each other as a resource just as much as you're using me. Um, can we ask you questions in between office hours? Absolutely. Please feel free to do that and uh, just post them in discussions and I'll be checking it regularly. And Whitney, how should we submit our assignments? That's a good question. I think that you're supposed to submit them in the discussion tab too, but I'll confirm how you submit them and I'll email everyone because I'm not exactly sure about the mechanics of that. Um, but yeah. Please feel free to keep that discussion tab active and reach out to me directly in it 
or again, each other. And uh, thanks, guys. Thanks so much. Looking forward to working with all of you.